Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, get out your King James Bibles. Today I just want to do a little Bible reading with the brethren. Okay? Just something God put on my heart. And uh, I was doing my uh, morning devotionals as they call them. But basically you're reading the Word of God every morning. Starting your day. I pray, brothers and sisters in Christ, you're starting your day with the Word of God. Well, I don't have time. Make time. That you're ending your day with the Word of God. Oh, but I'm just so tired. and. Uh, you need to push yourself to always end your day with the Word of God. Start your day with the Word of God, end your day with the Word of God, and over time, you'll find that you're going through the Word of God in your head and talking with the Lord throughout the whole day. Okay? Start your days, end your days. God put this on my heart. So turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And we're going to read all the way through chapter 15. This is just a Bible reading I wanted to read to encourage the brethren and to talk to you about it. So, so, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. The trump of God is the noise the trumpet makes. Okay, I just want to say it. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. We're supposed to be looking for the catching away of the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I've always taught this, and I pray that you always teach this in your own life. I teach this in my own life as well as yours. And you do the same as well as in the brethren, the brothers and sisters in Christ, that we need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. The whole point of keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ is that are we living a life of Christ? Is Jesus Lord of our life? When you put on that breastplate, we're going to talk about this, when you put on that breastplate of righteousness, that says, God is my commander, he's my chief, he's my lord, he's my savior, he's my king. He commands, I obey. I represent him following him. He commands, I obey. Right? That's what it means to be looking for Jesus. He could come back any day now. How is he going to find you? What kind of state is he going to find you? Right? The point is, is, I'm seeing lately that the brethren are getting quiet the fellowship, the comment section, I understand a lot of what has to do with YouTube and everything, but even on Rumble, uh, the emails, um, it just seems like we're getting quiet. I've seen so many brethren fall away. I had a brother in Christ attack me. I, I hope he's a brother in Christ. Um, but I've, I've had ones that aren't brothers in Christ. That just I just know they're not. They're, they're respecter of persons. But I've had brethren attack me because they start to fall away and they're, they're not mean about it they just they really attack truth but you have some people that are false brethren okay I had one false brethren on uh, Facebook uh, he was attacking final authority King James Bible is God's final authority Okay, and the thing that got to me was is that he's like, I was in the Brian Denlinger cult. If you don't know who Brian Denlinger is, it's King James Video Ministries. I was in the Brian Denlinger cult for five years, and one thing I wish I'd have asked him is, so what cult are you in now? Because that's all that man's about. A cult after a cult after a cult. He's a follower of men that ain't Jesus Christ. If he was truly saved and he's fallen away, what state is God going to find him when he comes back? Falling away. He doesn't believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word anymore. And he attributes it to a man because I was following a man and that man is Jesus Christ. I'm not a Denlinger cult. Not that there is one, but there are people who fall into the trap of respect of persons and they start following a man over Jesus Christ. And when the man's wrong, they follow him versus following the scriptures. But the point is, is when he's like, I was part of that Denlinger cult, he was a respecter of persons. He follows men that aren't Jesus Christ. So what cult is he following now? If he's truly saved, what state is God going to find him in when he comes back to get his bride, the body of Christ? What state is he going to find you in? That's the whole point of looking for Jesus Christ every day to come back. Okay, We're supposed to be doing this as Christians all the way back to... Uh, Paul, who wrote this, okay, be careful about that. Paul preached that you're to look for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes back, what state is he going to find you in? Present tense, for any generation. 
Now God has a specific, I agree with some of the teaching, where God has a specific time set up where he's going to come back. I agree with that. But Paul preaches and through God's word, and, and it's God's word preaching and teaching us that, hey, we're supposed to live every day like Jesus could come back in our lifetime today. That's how we're supposed to live. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters Christ, when I say it the way I say it, you can make it out like, oh, it's a burden or it's a fearful thing. It can be if you're out of fellowship with the Lord. But what does the Word of God say? Verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort. Okay? We, we're talking about in our studies the three salvations. We talked about eternal salvation, and I had a lot of people, <laughs> the easy believism people, that just want to go to heaven, but they want to keep their sin and live however they want to live. They attack the true plan of salvation. And then we talk, we're in the process of doing the second salvation, which is salvation in this life. Okay? Uh, cares of this world, which we're going to get into some of that. Uh, or actually, no, I'm doing multiple videos. I'm going to be sitting over by the pond later and do a uh, Bible by the pond that we're going to be talking about the cares of this world a little bit. But um, we talk about these things. But um, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things. And God has me working on lust of other things. I started it. I got it almost done for this week to put it out. And then God's like, you know what? Uh, you're not going to the direction I want it to go in. Okay, you're preaching a lot of things that are great to preach on. You can preach on the same things over and over. I'm not against that. But God was kind of warning me, hey, you're kind of preaching stuff that you've already preached several times. But what I really want you to preach is the specifics. What are the lusts of the flesh? Each specific. How they destroy the... the walk of a Christian with the Lord so that you become unfruitful. And I'm like, I was kind of generalizing it, but it's like, the Lord's right, so I'm redoing that study. <laughs> so, um, but those are the three things. Okay, is he going to come back? When he comes back, is he going to find you distracted by the cares of this world? Lusts of other things? Deceitfulness of riches? Okay, how's he going to find you? But why is this a comfort? Well, when we get to the third salvation, because that's called the, the whole series I'm doing that the Lord put in my heart for the brethren is the three salvation. Well, what's the third salvation? The third salvation is from this world. Either you die and your, and your soul is caught up to be with the Lord, or you get blessed. We're, we're blessed to be alive during the time of the catching away, which is talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? Death, to go be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, is a blessing. Okay? Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Hey, there's going to come a day where we're going to go to heaven. All this suffering we're doing down here, all these hardships, all this vexation, all this disappointment, struggling with the flesh and failing the Lord sometimes, losing that struggle with the flesh sometimes and failing the Lord, all that, it's going to be gone. We're going to go be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's the comfort. So even though it kind of sounds like, oh, it's kind of like it's a fearful thing, it is. It's a fearful thing if you're not living right with the Lord. Here. Not here. So many people say the right things, but they're not living those things. Whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do to the glory of God. Give God thanks in all things. Okay, he's be here. Chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that that day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I'm talking about at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. It comes as a thief in the night. Verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as faileth upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Escape what? The time of Jacob's trouble. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another word for Israel. You're no longer Jacob, but I will, your name is now Israel. Okay, Jacob's another name for Israel. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. But it says, brethren, ye are not in darkness 
What are we reading John 3.16? They always love the famous John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And it keeps going. I'm still working on memorizing that whole section, but it keeps going and talks about how men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Neither they come into the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Okay, when we get saved, we're not, we're not in darkness anymore. God, the Holy Spirit, is in us. We're supposed to be a light to the world. And the only way you're going to be a light to the world is if you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. How you live in your life for Christ, the changed life after salvation. To be set apart from this world, to be a light for Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We once were in darkness, but now we are in light. Verse 5, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Remember Revelation chapter 8 where it talks about uh, you're spiritually minded, walking after the capital S spirit. What were you before? Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. Light. Children of light. Children of the day. Versus children of the night. Uh, carnally minded and walking after the flesh. You know how Satan is always referred to as the darkness and Jesus is referred to as light? Uh, Jesus is the way. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Satan is the father of lies. So the light, if you're children of light, you're also children of truth. Absolute truth. And there's people that attack that. Okay? Why? Because they're children of night. They love lies. They like lies that conform to them and let them live however they want to live. But we're not that way anymore, brothers and sisters of Christ. How is Jesus going to find you when he comes back? Being a good light, children of light, children of the day? Or are you starting to fade? Is that light starting to fade? Are you starting to blend in with the world? Starting to go the way of the world? Are you starting to uh, back down on your stands for absolute truth? Are you a fish out of water? Remember being tossed to and fro with every doctrine? Are you a fish out of water? Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Sleep is another way of saying dead. Okay, our old man is dead and buried with Christ. We are a new creature in Christ Jesus. We are now truly alive. Okay, spiritually, we have eternal life. Our soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. That's why we're called the body of Christ. Okay. The dead, the lost world, that rejects Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, who reject the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. They reject that. They reject the changed life after salvation. They're asleep. They're dead and trespasses in sin. Okay, the law of sin and death. We are still under the law of sin. I talked about this, this body of flesh that you're looking at right here. Okay, my body of flesh, I still have to struggle with this. I'm still under the law of sin. I'm still a sinner as a saved sinner. Okay, but death doesn't apply as far as going to hell. To burn for it. Oh, I sinned again, so I get to go to hell, right? No. That's been paid for. But these people sleep. They're dead. They're still in dead. They're still dead in trespasses and sin. They're still under the law of sin and death. They're not under the law of God or the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8. That's why it says, therefore let us not sleep as, as do others. You have to act like the lost world. Give me a second. So, sorry about that. A good gush came by and it knocked something into the camera. So 
Sorry about that. Okay. We're not to sleep as others do. We have to look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes. We're not supposed to be silent. Once again, we're supposed to be a light. If you're starting to light starting to fade, you need to look at your life. Cares of this world, are they coming in? Get them out. All these extra responsibilities that you don't need, get them out of your life. Okay, deceitfuls of riches. You have to learn to be content with food and raiment. Especially if you're in ministry. Well, I've got all this stuff, all this stuff. It'll get in the way. Okay. Is that light fading? Lust of other things. Are you living in sin? Have you, the uh, addictions that God has cl cleared up and the sins that God got out of your life. I know if you're newly saved, God's got a lot of stuff to get out of your life. A lot of cleaning to do. He did with me. My life was just sinful and so wicked. And today, it's a struggle. God's got a lot of it out of my life, and from this day forward, it's a struggle not to fall back into past sins, past addictions. Is your light fading? Okay, are you, are you starting to look like the people that sleep? Mm -hmm. But let us watch and be sober. This is Paul preaching this. Let us watch and be sober. Watch for what? Jesus is coming. He can come back any day now. That's the teaching that Paul had. Did Jesus come back in his lifetime? No. But he always preached. You're supposed to look for him. He might not come back in your lifetime, but you're to look for him as if he is. Because he could. You're supposed to have that belief. He could come back any day. Thus watch and be sober. Verse 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night... And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. It's always talking about that. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary the devil, devil ro walks around like a roaming lion seeking whom he may devour. Hope I got that right. Probably not. I'm working on some of those verses, brothers and sisters. But uh, be sober, be vigilant. Oh, time and time again, be sober. Don't be drunken with this world. Don't fall back into this world. Okay? Don't let that light start fading out. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. What is this? That's the breastplate of righteousness. This gives us more detail to the righteousness. Faith and love. Okay? But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Who? God. Who's Jesus? God. What's the breastplate of righteousness? It's Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us, saying, this person's mine. He belongs to me. And when you wear that breastplate of righteousness, you're saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm His. He commands, I follow. Mm -hmm. Without faith, it's impossible to see it. It says, and love. Jesus said that there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Did you give your life to Jesus Christ? I, have, I come across so many Christians, false Christians, professing Christians, um, that say, yeah, I gave Jesus my life. My life belongs to Jesus, so he commands you. There's no greater love than this, and a man laid down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command. So Jesus commands, and you follow, right? Well, here you go trying to teach works-based salvation, and they go off on to the left. So, in other words, they didn't give their life to Jesus Christ. The true mark of someone who gave his life to Jesus Christ is Jesus commands them, and they obey. They'll fail the Lord sometimes. Like I said, we're still under the law of sin. You're going to fail the Lord sometimes. But your heart's desire is, is I want to obey God's commands. Lord, open this book to me and show me your commands. The do's, the don'ts. Jesus also said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. But if a man love me, he'll keep my words. You put on that breastplate of righteousness, it's also faith and love. It means I belong to Jesus Christ. I have to have the faith that God knows what he's talking about. When he says, do this, I need to do it. When he says, don't do that, I need to stop it. Here's the stands. You're supposed to be separate from the world. Love not the world. Abstain from all appearance of evil. 
High, uh, study to show thy Second Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly divided in the word of truth. Okay? Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. These are all commands. Mm -hmm. That's how you love Jesus Christ. Loving Jesus Christ, this fake thing that you get in these charismatic Babel buildings, now it's all, almost in all of them, it's this flesh thing. It's all flesh rise. You get rise, you feed the flesh, and then you call it love and say, it's me loving Jesus Christ. No, it isn't. Okay. The flesh is contrary to the Spirit. Okay? And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8. So the breastplate of faith and love. Do you have that breastplate on? Or did you take it off? Is that light fading? And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. See, this is the biggest thing. People say the helmet of salvation for when it comes to the armor of God. It just means we remember that God saved us, and that's it. No, here it explains it even in more detail. The hope of salvation. What's this whole passage that we're reading talking about? Keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. That someday we get to be with Him. We're going to have an incorruptible body that no longer gets tempted. We don't have to deal with sin anymore. Disappointing the Lord. Letting Him down. This body that's fallen apart. We don't have to deal with pain so on and so forth. The helmet, the hope of salvation. That blessed hope. We're supposed to be looking forward to Jesus coming back any day now. I remember that uh, a brethren was doing a teaching. He talked about how some people are like, well, Lord, I don't want you to come back just right now because, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really ready yet. Because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm indulging into some sins and, and, you know, I'm really going hardcore for physical wealth, you know, the deceitfulness of riches. I'm trying to get this, and I'm trying to get that, and then the cares of this world, and, and, and I'm not really ready for you to come back, Lord. What happened? He took off that helmet. That's supposed to be a hope of salvation. You're supposed to be living every day, making sure that you're ready for Jesus to come back. Will I ever be truly, honestly, 100% ready for Jesus to come back? No, I'm always going to be struggling and trying to fix things. But, my, but I don't want Jesus coming back finding me flat on my face. The Bible talks about the falling away. About not fainting and not faltering. To be sober. I don't want Jesus coming back and finding me flat on my face, but I'm looking forward to it. God's got my life to the point where I'm trying to do the work of the Lord, but every day I'm sitting out here talking to the Lord, saying it's today the day. I'm looking forward to it. And there's a difference between somebody who's living right according to the Word of God, that their light is shining, your light is shining, brother and sister Christ. There's a difference between somebody who has that breastplate of righteousness on, the breastplate of love, uh, faith and love, they have that on, and they're doing their best to live a life of Christ. They're suffering, they're failing the Lord a little bit here and there. There's a difference between that person and a false convert that just wrecks their life over and over, because the Bible says, if you live by the flesh, you shall die. That's saved and lost, but the professing Christians, people don't seem to understand that it, it applies to the lost, too. We always say it applies to saved Christians. It applies to me. But it's almost like we forget sometimes. Well, remember, it started out with, it applies to the lost, but it applies to both. Okay? So you get these people that they're professing to be Christians. They're making a wreck of their life because they refuse to let the Lord be the Lord of their life. They refuse to give their life to Jesus Christ. They're false converts. And they make a wreck of their life, and they're sitting there going, Oh, I just wish Jesus would come back. I just want to go to heaven. I just want to go to heaven. Boy, are they up for a rude awakening. If the catching away of the body of Christ happens in their lifetime, they're up for a rude awakening when they get left behind. Why? Because they don't have that helmet for a hope of salvation. They're not keeping their eyes on Jesus Christ. They're not focusing on their life to make sure that their life is a life of Christ. A life that's pleasing to Jesus. When he comes back, what state is he going to find you in? And I'm telling you right now, brother, says Christ, if you're saying, well, the state of my life isn't really that good right now, get to work. Ask the Lord for help. He'll do it. He'll clean it up and get it back to a good state that you'd be proud, that you'd go, Lord, that Lord will come back and say, well done, thou good and faithful one. I've made a mess of my life. There's times in my life I was so glad the Lord didn't come back. I'm talking about in the past. 
Looking forward, no, I want to come back any day, but looking back, I've made some serious mistakes in my life in the past. And I look back and say, what if the Lord came back that day? Oh Lord, you would not have been saying, well done, thou good and faithful one. I was flat on my face. I would made a lot of mistakes as a Christian, especially a new Christian. A babe in Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's the hope of salvation. We're hoping that someday we get to be with our Lord and Savior for all eternity. We're looking for that day. No more dealing with this flesh. No more dealing with the lost world. This wicked world. No more debating. No more arguing. People trying to get you into arguments. No, you know, no more denying the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. The Bible talks about every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone's going to confess the real Jesus Christ as Lord. The one that they deny, these false Christians, these false converts, and just flat out Christ rejecting sinners, flat out denying. We have that hope that we're going to get out of here someday. Big gust of wind is coming. <laughs> it's a windy day today. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That verse right there debunks post and mid-trib. Because they always say, well, it, we could go through some of this. That right there debunks it. It says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Jesus opens the first seal and unleashes the Antichrist to start the time of Jacob's trouble. That's God pouring out his wrath. Okay. God has not appointed us to, us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need purification. I'm purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. I've obtained salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? How, well, how did you do that? By coming to Him broken in true biblical repentance. Sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned towards God Almighty, your Creator. You understand that because of those sins, you're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity and then toss in the lake of fire. You're going to hell for your sins and you deserve to go there. Lord, I'm so sorry for sinning against you. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Death, burial, and resurrection. He died. The blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood. And it was shed to pay for my sins. Paid the price that I should pay. Yeah. And then uh, you confess both in prayer. The Bible talks about, in Romans, how you're, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation why do we confess because we're proving that we're not ashamed there's a lot of people that'll just say something to say it and then later they're ashamed and they regret it and they turn their back and walk the other way you confess to God your repentance and your belief to show that you're not ashamed and then you ask God to save you why showing that you don't deserve it it's not a pride thing that you've dropped your pride and self there's no self right you dropped your pride and, and stopped going about to seek your own righteousness that's why you ask God to save you anybody that tells you you don't ask God to save you they're prideful they have pride they're the ones going about to establish their own righteousness I saved myself with my faith they don't ask God and say Lord please save me I don't deserve it I deserve to go to hell. I don't deserve what you did for me on the cross. Lord, please be merciful to me, a save a sinner. Please save me. It never comes to that with them. With us, it did. Verse 10. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Then it goes back to dead in Christ shall rise first. Whether he didn't come back in your lifetime, you looked for him in your lifetime, you did your best to live a life of Christ, failed the Lord here and there, but you did your best to live, love the Lord, keeping his word, love the Lord with all your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. You love the Lord with all your heart, and you lived your best, and you died, you're still going to be raised with those who are still alive. So it goes back to those people. Whether we wake or sleep, Talking about the dead in Christ. And then there's going to be people that are alive that get to see the catching away of the body of Christ. And I pray that's us. 
I pray that's me. We should live together with Him. That's where you get up to 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We get to go live with Jesus Christ. Verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. There it is again. It's a comfort. And edify one another, even as ye all, even also, I'm sorry, even as also ye do. And these post and mid-tribs, it's not a comfort to them that Jesus has come back before the time of Jacob's trouble. To take his body, uh, the body of Christ away. It's not a comfort to them. It is to us. Verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. To know. You know, throughout all the Bible, brother, sister, and Christ, uh, Paul's warning us about false brethren. He's warning us about wolves in sheep's clothing. He warns us about enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, whose end is destruction. Saying, we beseech you, brethren, beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, among you. You know, they labor among the word. There's people that preach the word. There's people that are there that they still stand for the word. And they'll preach it a little bit here and there, but they're there to help the body of Christ out. I'm here to help you. Do you need help? Whether it's physical help, spiritual help, being there for a brother or sister in Christ spiritually, praying for them, pointing them to the word of God. But let, brethren, know then which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. I pray that's what this is doing. If your life is not right with the Lord right now, you need to get it right with the Lord. He can come back any day now. That's admonishing you, trying to encourage you, and trying to lift you out. But it says remember. Or, I'm sorry, know them. Verse 13. And to esteem them very highly in love for their works' sake. See, today it's all about respect to persons. Who cares about the work's sake? It's just you're supposed to highly, uh, you're supposed to esteem them very highly in love regardless. If that's our man, we're going to follow him. No, for the works' sake. What are their fruits? They got great fruit, fruits. Esteem them very highly in love for the works' sake. Sometimes I see brethren that get in the ministry, they start to slip, and they start to fall to the left, or they start falling to the right, or they become stagnant. Okay, They're not doing as much for the Lord as they used to. What's going on? I believe that that light is fading a little bit. I believe that uh, the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things are coming in. And they're getting distracted. Whether it's by sin, by responsibilities, like too much responsibilities that they don't know, that they shouldn't have or don't need, get rid of them so you're freed up to continue doing the work of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But to highly love them for their work's sake. I don't know how many people I've seen turn on brethren in ministry because they said something they didn't like. Okay, I don't agree with everything that Brother JT puts out, Brother Brian puts out. Um, Brad Aversheim at uh, Cannibal KJV. I don't believe everything. We all need to be on the same page. I understand that. There's sometimes where I'm wrong and I'm corrected, and a brother helps me get back on the same page along with the Word of God and the majority of the body of Christ. Now remember, the majority doesn't rule. God's Word rules. Because some people say that. Well, what if the majority believes something that's against Scripture? You go off Scripture first. But the point is, is we're all supposed to be on one page. And there's times that we'll see brethren get off and they need to be brought back to be of one mind. One body, one mind. Mm -hmm. But for the work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. I made some videos because of the Trinity versus the Godhead, and the Trinity loses every time. It's the Godhead. But you're going to get people out there, I guess I had the one guy trying to get me to, to argue and debate the authority of Scripture. Well, I threw a few scriptures at him and then realized he didn't care about scripture. So how can you teach the authority of scripture? Through the word of God. But if he doesn't believe in the word of God, what happens if you keep going? You start casting pearls before swine. And they'll end up turning around and rending you. I don't want to be rended. So I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. Link the Bible version issue. I link the plan of salvation. And let them go. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. But you have brethren where you get so riled up through debating what you're not supposed to be doing and through arguing what you're not supposed to be doing. 
okay? And there's not peace among the brethren. There for a while, there's always, the, the number one reason you'll have a lot of drama among the brethren is because you've had wolves in sheep's clothing slither, sneak in. Snakes slithering in. False converts. Okay? People that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They come in pretending, I'm one of you, I believe everything you do. And then over time, they start sowing seeds of discord among the brethren, and they cause a lot of uh, drama, what I call drama. But they take the peace away from the brethren when it comes to us being together and being having peace as one, as the body of Christ. Okay, it says here, and be at peace among yourselves. I won't argue with the brother in Christ about the Word of God. I will discuss it, and I'll try to show absolute truth. If they, prove, if they show me I'm wrong in Scripture, I will repent and correct that teaching or how I'm living. The scripture, if they can't prove it, because most of the time I get corrected, brother and sister in Christ, online and everything, it's about feelings and opinions. They don't use scripture. And you'll find that, I just want to point that out, you'll find that in your life a lot. 80 to 90% of the time I get corrected, it's done by, by, it's based off of the world. Feelings and opinions. The flesh. It's not based off, like, the man's wisdom and man's superiority. It's not based off the word of God. Mm -hmm. But if it gets to the point where it feels like it's an argument or a debate, there's times where I failed the Lord and I got into an argument and a debate. But the Lord's working on me to say, hey, if it gets to that point, stop it. Maybe come back and talk to him a little bit later when we both have calmed down, but stop it. You're not supposed to be arguing, debating among the brethren. Okay? When it comes to the Word of God. People always grab from the Old Testament, it says, debate thy cause with thy neighbor. It's talking about if I feel a neighbor has done something wrong to me. If I feel like uh, something that has to do with the world, that we should be doing things this way or we should be doing things that way, it has nothing to do with Scripture as far as being a sin or not a sin, it's just that there's multiple ways of doing something, and I'm saying this way is the way we should be doing it. You debate your cause. Okay, this is why I want to do it this way. Okay, we can build this bridge three different ways, but I think this is the best way to be the most sturdiest, that'll last the longest, and so on and so forth. Debate thy cause. Okay. That's what the Old Testament is talking about. It's not talking about the Word of God when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to absolute truth. We're not supposed to be debating absolute truth. We're supposed to be showing absolute truth. Do you want it? No? Then okay. I'll go to somebody who does. There's supposed to be peace among the brethren. And like I said, the number one reason I see in the body of Christ today, the number one reason I see why there's not that much peace out there is because people have let false brethren come on in. Let wolves in sheep's clothing come on in. They start watching and following wolves in sheep's clothing that mess them up doctrinally and spiritually and destroys their fellowship. There was a guy that I knew, um, Tim, at AVB TV, whatever. He, I, I have a hard time remembering his uh, channel. But you have a guy there that basically, when you actually look down to it, all the drama that went on between him and Brian, uh, him and I had drama that I just tried to preach truth to him and he didn't want the truth. But what it came down to is he chose sin over fellowship. He chose video games Hollywood movies, um, secular style music. He chose all this stuff over the fellowship with the brethren. I I'm sorry. If someone came to me and said, you know, they never would. I'm just using this as an example. If they came to me and we're having great fellowship, we have peace among yourselves, and they come to me and say there was an icon on this hat. There isn't one, but let's say there was an emblem on this hat that kind of looks like a such and such emblem that has to do with an occult and witchcraft or false gods and stuff like that. This hat's going bye-bye. It's that simple. Video games, it's not worth it. You losing fellowship over the brethren. But he chose video games over fellowship with the brethren. And brother, brother, sister, I've seen this a lot. It's not just video games. It's not just him. There's a lot of brethren that Sin's coming back into their life, sin that they got out of their life, and they start choosing sin over a fellowship with the brethren. Cares this world come in, and they affect your ability to have peace among the brethren. 
Deceitfulness of riches will do it. Lust of other things, sin. And I see that among the brethren. They start choosing sin over fellowship with the brethren. It's not worth it. We're so desperate in these last days for true fellowship among the brethren, and yet we have brethren choosing the world and the ways of the world, you know, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and sin. And then they sit there and complain, we don't have that much good fellowship with the brethren. I wish I had a good fellowship. I wish I had a fellowship circle. I wish I had a group of guys to Bible, uh, do Bible studies with. Man, we're just so desperate for fellowship. Well, why is that today as a body of Christ? Something to think about, brothers and sisters. Look at it in your life. I'm looking at it in my life. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. <laughs> People that are living in sin. People that are causing problems. They start getting, I don't know if it's a natural spirit, but sometimes it's got, people call it the spirit of negativity. I get it. I get to where I get negative. I start sitting there realizing for the last, I'm sitting there talking with the Lord about something good, and then somehow I get on a subject about a brother in Christ or my past, parts where I've failed the Lord. I've already asked for forgiveness. God has forgiven me. He's picked me back up. He's put me back on the right path. But you get stuck on negativity and you start just being negative. Oh, I used to do this. I couldn't believe I did that. And I was just working... And this brother over here, he shouldn't be doing that. And, and you're just getting so negative, and then you start projecting that to the body of Christ. And you start passing that negativity around. What happens? You're becoming unruly. You're causing problems, division. You're taking away the peace among the brethren. Now, there's times where we're going to preach absolute truth, and as we preach absolute truth and stand for absolute truth, the wolves in sheep's clothing are going to start to pop out. Okay, there's a difference. We're preaching truth, but I'm talking about when you let sin in your life, your disappointments in your life, uh, or the sin in other brethren's lives. Okay, by all means, correct a brother in Christ. If he wants to hear it, praise the Lord. You want a brother to Christ, back to the Lord, as far as his walk with the Lord being right and strong. If he doesn't want to hear you, brush, uh, brush the dirt off your feet. Okay? Uh, uh, there's Matthew 9, uh, 5, I think chapter 5 talks about how we're supposed to treat it, you know, you take a second brother with you, then the whole church talks to him, and if he refuses to hear the whole church, he's to be as a heathen man and a publican, okay, you treat him as a lost person, you put him out of your fellowship, okay, that's why it says warn them that are unruly, if you don't stop, we're going to have to put you out of our fellowship, I've had to put people out of my fellowship, because of sin. I had to put people out of my fellowship because it seemed like they were causing conflict too much. They were whining and complaining. Come to find out they were false converts. They came in to sow seeds of discord. They whisper things behind them. Well, that Brian, he, at first, Brian, Brother Brian's great. Or Brother JT, or Brother Philip, or whoever. Brother Brad. They're great. But then after a while, they start saying, but you know, this that. He's just so wrong here. He really shouldn't hear. We really shouldn't follow. And it gets to the point where we really shouldn't follow him. You know, we Someone needs to just really rip into him and tell him the truth. And it's, it causes so, They're sowing seeds of discord. They're being unruly. Okay. There's nothing wrong with correction, but the Bible has a set way of doing things. If you're going to correct a brother in Christ, you go with the second brother to correct him. Then the whole church is all, not every church member, but the elders in the church. You have a group, a huge a group, five or six people. A, group, a huge group of us went and talked to Tim at ABBT. Oh, I keep doing it wrong, but Tim, we talked to him. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but we talked to this man that was supposed to be a brother in Christ. We went to him as a whole, as a body of Christ. He rejected us. What did we do? You have to, he's to be as a heathen man and a publican. You treat him as if he's lost. You, you kick him out of your fellowship. Now, I believe he is lost. He's a false convert. But we get to heaven and I'm wrong. Praise the Lord. We get to heaven and I was right and I said nothing and did nothing. You think I'm going to be saying praise the Lord? No, I'm not. That's why I'm doing it now. Okay? We did that. There's a set way of doing things. That's why you warn them that are unruly. You show them scripture. You give them warning. The next one says, Comfort the feeble-minded. 
Would we just say up there, comfort one another with these words. One of the ways you comfort feeble minded is you point them to Jesus Christ and keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. That childlike love that they have for Jesus Christ. Right now you look out in the world and they're doing things to the feeble minded that just makes your jaws just makes you want to just pick up a sword and do something about it. Because it's just what they're doing to the feeble minded out there in the world, it's just evil and wickedness. We're to comfort the feeble minded. Okay? Support the weak. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're gonna have elders in in uh, I'm talking about physical weakness right now. You're gonna have elders in the church that as they get older they're gonna get weaker and they're gonna need help from the younger to do their day to day lives and day to day living. We're so spread out it's hard to do that, but if you have an elder brother or sister in Christ near you and you're a young brother and sister in Christ, you need to have that heartfelt attitude, I need to help them. Okay, I need to support them. You go by their house once a week to see how they're doing. Do you need help around the house? That kind of thing. Okay, but spiritually, support the weak. There's some people that, like for me, my weaknesses are video games, movies, TV shows. Okay, that's what I was really addicted to. So that's my weaknesses. Okay, it says support the weak. Okay, brother, make sure you stay away from that stuff. Encourage me. Ask me. I mean, nobody does, but ask that brother once a week. How are you doing? And how's your walk going with the Lord? How are you doing in those areas? I asked a woman that professes to be saved once, how are you doing in those areas? And this woman's a drunk. She's a drug addict. She's a feminist. But she professes to be saved. I asked her how she was doing in those areas, and she blew up on me. Just went crazy on me. Who are you to judge me? You're just trying to be holier than thou. She did everything that Brother Brian did that study that you have the lost world do when we call out sin and try to hold people accountable to the Word of God when it comes to sin. Someone comes to me and says, how are you doing in those areas? You're supporting the weak. Can I show you some scripture to help lift you back up, to encourage you to stay strong, stay standing? Oh, you've fallen? Well, you need to get back up. Only God can get you back up. You've got to submit yourself back to the Lord. The Bible says, if any man come after me, as Jesus speaking, if any man come after me, he will deny himself and pick up his cross daily and follow me. You need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and get back to following the Lord. Okay? Two parts to that. The part with the word weak. Okay? Be patient towards all men. That says all men. Oh, no, no, no. That's just all Christian men. The brethren. No, it isn't. It says you're to be patient to all men. You're also, I mean, some of us can be quick to be angry, but you can be angry with the cause, but you're still supposed to be slow to anger, and you're supposed to be patient. Okay? I remember correcting someone online. They, they quoted an NIV psalm, and I quoted the, the Bible, and the Bible talks about being uh, slow to wrath and have a quick spirit talking about action. It's all... The NIV makes it out to be a feeling. It's just a feeling. It's just a feeling. But the Bible talks about how it's an action. You're not supposed to be quick to action. You're supposed to be patient with all men. You're not supposed to be quick to act and pass judgment. You need to be patient. Okay, what's going on? Try to preach truth to them. Try to lift them back up. If they're lost, you still try to preach Jesus Christ, the truth to them. Okay? Be patient to all men. If you're just quick to yell, quick to be angry, quick to make fun of, quick to mock, I believe it's a sin for a Christian to mock. I do. Mocking belongs to the Lord. He will do all the mocking. Trust me. He's got lots of mocking he's doing and will be doing. Okay? We're not supposed to be doing mocking. We're not supposed to be using, the Bible talks about jesting. Okay? We're supposed to be patient. We're supposed to be, choose our words carefully. You know, if you're patient and you think before you speak, I've always been told when I was younger and I was lost, I was a professing Christian, I remember my uncle always telling me that you need to stop. And my grandfather just said the same thing. You need to think before you speak. I was so quick to speak. I wasn't patient. When you hear something, sometimes when it's wrong, you hear it, you know it's wrong, but you want to jump up right away and say something. There's times where you need to stop and think and be patient. Take some time with the Lord and talk with the Lord about what that person said or what that person did. 
and do a Bible study and then go talk to that person. Okay? You don't talk you don't talk to somebody when you're angry. <laughs> uh, you know, you wait till you calm down and then you talk to them. Okay? You be patient towards all men. Verse 15, see that none render evil for evil. That tends to happen when you aren't patient towards all men. Okay, I've seen that with among some of the brethren that I believe are saved. They start falling in the trap of rewarding evil with evil. Okay, especially in ministry, uh, pasting people's faces and and making fun of them and mocking them and everything. That's what the lost world does to us. We're not to reward evil with evil. Okay, it says so. See that that none render evil for evil unto any man. Cause some people say, well, it's not. I won't do that to Bible believing Christians, but to wolves in sheep's clothing and and the lost world. No, it says to any man. We're going to get to the point where it proves that this is talking about the whole world, any man. We don't render evil for evil. If someone hurts you, you don't hurt them back. Okay, the Bible talks about heaping coals of fire on their head every time that you do right by them when they're doing wrong by you. You're heaping coals of fire upon their head. Who's, the Bible also talks about whose damnation is just when you're talking about the lost world. You do right by the lost world. You do nice things for the lost world. You better make sure you're preaching the gospel. But you're still supposed to do good things for the lost world do, and be right, do right by the lost world. You're heaping coals of fire. When they want, if they end up dying in their sins, rejecting Jesus Christ, the coals of fire that's on their head is talking about hell, whose damnation is just. You're not supposed to become like them. I, I, that's a great big warning to the brethren. But ever follow that which is good. Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is only one good, and that is God in heaven. Jesus is God. Be ever follow that which is good. Jesus Christ. Okay. Remember he said that, uh, the two greatest commandments is uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, I get it mixed up. Heart, mind, body, soul. It's three things, but it's one of those three things. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Ever follow that, which is good. If you don't want them, like the lost world, if you don't like it when they're mocking you and making fun of you and cutting up your videos and pasting your face and stuff like that, because I've seen it done to me. You know, I praise the Lord that I'm counted worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ, that I'm suffering persecution where they're mocking me and they're making fun of me and everything and putting me down. But I don't like it as far as I don't like them doing it. I wish they didn't do it. I'm not going to do it to them. I don't want it done to me. I'm not going to do it to them. Okay? And here it is. It says, But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. That's how we know he's talking about all men. To yourselves, brothers and sisters in Christ, the body of Christ, and to all men. Okay, that's how we know when it says all men, it's saying all men, saved and lost. Okay. Verse 16, rejoice evermore, brothers and sisters of Christ, rejoice. Give God glory in everything. Something great happens to you, praise the Lord. God blesses you with things, praise the Lord. Rejoice evermore. Have you forgotten to rejoice? Has that light started to fade a little bit and you're not rejoicing as much as you ought to? Are you being content with food and raiment? Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever state that I am in. Especially if you're in ministry. Remember, this is written, uh, what is it, uh, 2 Timothy, First and Second Timothy is written to young men in ministry. We're reading, uh, not reading, uh, Titus, I was thinking Titus, I was doing a study in Titus, where it's, uh, it's written to a young man who's in ministry. Okay? you got to be content with whatever, whatever state you're in. Okay, Are you forgetting to get rejoice in whatever state that you're in? Are you one of those people, I need a little bit more, I need a little bit more. I just need a little bit more and then I can be happy. I just need a little bit more, then I can rejoice. No, you need to rejoice in the present tense, here and now. Are you rejoicing evermore? Giving God glory in everything. I've always quite preached and taught, and I've had brethren fall away, and I've had false brethren appear that you can tell they're false that when I tell them and I preach this and I still teach this to this day because the Bible teaches this if you can't give God glory in it 
You can't give God thanks in it, which is the next verse we're going to get to, a couple verses down. If you can't give God thanks in it, you can't rejoice in it, if you can't give God glory in it, you shouldn't be doing it. The Bible doesn't say we have the right to have fun and be entertained. That's the world. That's the flesh. And so many people are going the way of the world because they want to have fun and they want to be entertained. They want their flesh entertained. Okay? If you can't rejoice in it, you shouldn't be doing it. Rejoice evermore. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. You need to be talking with the Lord about everything. I'm cooking dinner. I talk to the Lord about the dinner. I talk to the Lord about things I got done that day. Uh, that He allowed me to get done that day. Give God the glory. I almost took glory for myself. Give God the glory. That He allowed me to get done. And I talked to Him about things that I need to get done. I talked about things of the world. I sit out here and talk to the Lord. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm talking to the Lord. Doing work in the yard, I'm talking with the Lord. And these last days, brothers and sisters in Christ, fellowship is hard to find. The number one thing you're going to have, the person, number one person you're going to have to talk to, person, there's only one person in the Godhead. The number one person you're going to have to talk to is who? Jesus Christ. You're going to have to pray without ceasing today. Or you're going to start falling away. You need to talk with the Lord constantly. People say, I'm a crazy man. He's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. Sometimes I'll talk out loud with the Lord. It helps me stay focused and not get distracted. Because with my mind... I can get distracted and start thinking of this, or I start thinking of that, worldly stuff, movies, TV shows. I talk out loud sometimes because it helps me stay focused. Pray without ceasing. Verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There's the thanks. It's the will of God. You're going to give thanks in all things. Don't forget to thank a brother or sister in Christ for helping you out. Brother, sister Christ, I'll do it again. The camera I'm using right now, a little bit more than half of what it cost to buy this camera, the body of Christ helped me out with. Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother, sister Christ, for your donations at that time. Right. People ask, why don't you take donations? God's provided for me. There are brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are struggling financially and... And it's not because they're just being lazy or anything. We are in hard times for Christians. You either go along with the system and turn your back on the Word of God, or you stick with the Word of God, and that might mean that you lose your job. Okay? I'm doing my best to try to help the brothers and sisters of Christ that out that need it, and I pray that you guys are too. Give thanks in all things. Okay. But going back to the donation thing, brother, sister, Christ, I've had people hit me up. Oh, I really feel called to donate. I have a PO box. It's on the about page of YouTube. I have an email address and I have a PO box. If you really feel called, that God's just calling you to donate to this ministry, send me a letter in the mail. I, I'm not saying send me money, but I'm saying if you feel so called that, regardless of what I, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that. If God really feels called, I don't want to hinder your rewards in heaven. I don't. Mail me a check. Mail me a, a, a money order. If you really feel called, and I'm, he's, I'm not being stubborn, there's still a door open that you can donate money to this ministry if you wish. By all means. I'm just saying right now, God's got me covered in food and raiment. He even blessed me with a roof over my head. That's an extra blessing. People think that's part of it. No, it isn't. It just says food and raiment. It doesn't say anything about a roof over your head. That's an extra blessing. I might be living on the streets in the future. I might be living out of my truck. Life could get tough for, for Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women out there. Okay? God promised that He could keep you clothed and give you food. He didn't promise you five or six square meals a day. <laughs> which seems like Americans do. Uh, he didn't promise you three square meals a day. He just promised to feed you. So if you have to go two or three days without food, and you only eat every two or three days, God is still feeding you. And you need to be content. And you need to be thankful. Okay? Be thankful. 19. Quench not the Spirit. 
The biggest way I see how brethren are quenching the Spirit, the Bible says, Quench not the Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The number one way you quench the Spirit is when you doubt your salvation constantly. I disagree with Peter Ruckman. To this day, I disagree with him. He used to say that he would doubt his salvation every once in a while. Well, how long? For a few seconds. Well, what keeps you from continuing to doubt? And he, you know, he'd hold on to the piano and say, this is keeping me from going down there to hell, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. But the thing is, is he's quenching the Spirit every time. He, if he's doubting God, his salvation every day, that's quenching the Spirit. You're not supposed to be like that as a Christian. You need to get to a point where you are secure in your salvation. You are secure that you understand, I am sealed into the day of redemption. Now, there are a lot of false converts that need to doubt their salvation so they can truly get saved. And you have newly saved Christians, I was one, that you're going to doubt your salvation a little bit because you're newly saved and you're fighting God. He's trying to clean up your life and get the junk out of your life and you're fighting Him. Okay? I was one. God was trying to clean up my life and I was fighting Him. I fought Him on the video games. I fought Him on the, the movies and the TV shows. I fought Him on the porn. I fought Him on the addictions. Fast food eating. The, you know, I fought Him on things when I was newly saved. So there was times where I had every right to doubt my salvation because it's like, did you give your life to Jesus Christ? Well, well, yeah, then why are you fighting them on this? I can't say that enough to brethren. Did you give your life to Jesus Christ? I come across a lot of fakes more than I do actual brethren in these last days. But I come across some brethren that I have to do that. Did you truly give your life to Christ? Then why are you fighting them on it? The Bible says we're saved from all appearance of evil. There's a lot of evil and wickedness in all games. No matter how innocent they look, they're, plant, they're about feeding your flesh, getting you addicted, and getting you into the games that aren't innocent. That uh, alcohol, being a drunkard. Did you give your life to Christ? Well, yeah, I gave my life to Christ. Then why are you fighting them on it? Get that alcohol out of your life. Get the people out of your life that promote the alcohol, like the, your drunk buddies your cigarette smoking buddies, your weed smoking buddies, movie buddies. My mom was my movie buddy. I don't really spend much time with my mom anymore. All she wants to do is quote TV shows and movies. And it's like, sorry, I had to get her out of my life. I still say hello to her, I talk to her, I'll take her out to see her. I used to see her like once or twice a year. She'd come over here to the coast and I'd be able to walk on the beach and talk with her for a few minutes. But we don't spend, we used to spend, go to movies every week I take her out to dinner once a week, and it's like we don't have that much. In we don't have anything in common anymore. I had to get her out of my life. So if I said no, I'm going to keep her in my life. I'm going to keep listening to the movie concepts. I'm going to keep taking her to movies every Friday. Did I give my Lord? Did, did I give my life to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? When you're newly saved, you, you're going to doubt. You, you're going to have some Christians, and I was one of them, that really fight the Lord. Some don't. Some are just so, I want to live for you, Lord, and they don't fight the Lord as much. And then there are some of us who do fight the Lord a lot. And those of us who do fight the Lord, that's why we need to doubt our salvation. Did you truly give your life to Jesus Christ? Why are you fighting Him? If you truly gave your life to Jesus Christ, He owns you, you belong to Him, He commands, you obey. Why are you fighting Him? But brothers and sisters of Christ, you need to get to a point in your life where God has cleaned up your life, you submit to your, yourself to God in all things. Kind of like how the wife is supposed to be in subjection to her husband in all things. That's how the body of Christ is supposed to be to Jesus Christ. Or the bride of Christ. You're supposed to be in subjection to Jesus in all areas of your life. None of it's yours. Okay? You need to get to a point where you're not quenching the Spirit. You have that assurance of salvation. And when the lost world comes in and tries to take that from you, they can't take it from you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm still a sinner. Yeah, I still fail the Lord. Please forgive me. Pick me back up. Get me back on the right track. But you ain't taking my assurance of salvation. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So we can know we have eternal life 
and we can believe that we're sealed into the day of redemption. Okay? Quench not the Spirit. 20. Despise not prophesying. Okay? Despise not when people are... Because there's times we get vexed by the world and we're getting sick and tired of the world and we get preachers that preach, hey, the Bible said this was going to happen or that's going to happen. Despise not prophesying. Despise not prophesying about the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Despise not prophesying when it comes to the time of Jacob's trouble, the millennial kingdom. Despise not prophesying when it comes to preaching hell. Some Christians try to take hell out of, of the plan of salvation. Well, then what is Jesus saving you from? What's the consequences of sin? We can't talk about the consequences of sin. We can't tell the lost that they're on their way to hell. Future prophecy. No, we can't do that. We can't do that. Despise not prophesying. Don't let people come to you and say, well, we've got to dumb down the gospel and make it more pleasing to the world. In other words, we try to make a plan of salvation that conforms to the world so the world will accept it. That's not how we're supposed to be, brothers and sisters Christ. We stick to the true plan of salvation. Hell is real. You are a sinner, and you're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. You have a sickness. That sickness is sin. There's only one cure. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. And that sickness is going to send you to hell. Okay? Despise not prophesying. Brothers and sisters Christ, we need to be talking about the catching away of the body of Christ, especially in these last days. Okay? We need to talk about, you know, keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. What state is He going to find you in when He comes back? That's future prophecy. He's going to come back someday. What state is He going to find you in? There's some day that you, if He might not come back in your time, there's some day that you're going to die. What state are you going to die in? I'm not talking about dying in a state of grace to go to heaven. I'm talking about, are you going to be on your deathbed and going to be looking back at your life and say, man, I wasted so much of my life that I should have been serving the Lord. You, go, you get caught your soul. When you die, your soul gets caught up. What state is Jesus going to be finding you in when you stand before Him? A man that He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or is He going to look at you and go, well, you kind of disappointed me there, my son, my daughter, you know, being a, a child of God. You kind of disappointed me. There's times where I've really disappointed the Lord and I, I'm working hard to make God, to please God. What, what, um, why were we created? People will always beat all around the bush and everything, and it's so simple. Okay, for thou hast, it's talking about Jesus Christ, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. How hard was that to answer that? What's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of life? To please God. So what's the meaning of life? To please God. It's easy. Despise not prophesying. We're supposed to point people to Jesus Christ, lost and saved. So us can lose our way and need to be put back on the path. Mm -hmm. 21. Prove all things. There it is. Prove all things. Oh, no, no, no. You don't have to prove yourself. Time and time again, the Bible talks about fruit. Good fruit, bad fruit. Fake fruit. Fruit that looks like good fruit, but you can't eat it. It's poison. Okay? By their fruits you shall know them. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Prove all things. In all areas of your life you need to be proving that I love the Lord and that I'm living for Him and that this is God's perfect written word. you got to prove all things. You don't prove that this is God's perfect written word to somebody who hates God's word what I mean by proving that this is God's perfect written word is it in your heart. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If you're hiding it in your heart, you're going to be living it. Mm -hmm. And if you're living it, you're going to be proving that this book, the King James Bible, is God's perfect written word in English. Mm -hmm. Hold fast to that which is good. There it is. He warns him a second time. Hold fast to that which is good. Okay. Look it up top.
There it is. But ever, verse 15, but ever follow that which is good. Not only are we supposed to follow it, it says here, hold fast to that which is good. You know how the Bible talks about, uh, seek ye the old paths? The Bible says this is the way we're supposed to do something and it's good. Hold on to it. You're not only supposed to be seeking it, okay, where's all the good things? Once you seek it and you find it, you're to grab it and hold on to it. Okay? This, since God saved my life and turned me around, He's shown me how to live my life, how to live a life of Christ, how to abstain from all appearance of evil. Prayer life, you need to have a strong prayer life. You need to start your day with the Word of God. You need to end your day with the Word of God. These are all good things, and you need to hold on to them fast. Don't let anybody take them from you. Oh, you don't have to start your day with the Bible every day. Get out of my life. Get away from me. Don't get. No, I don't want you around me. I'm holding on to that which is good. Oh, that King James Bible. Oh, it's, you know, the other Bibles are just, get away from me. I'm holding on to that which is good. And I've seen people fall away from their stands for the Bible. From uh, not staying, I, I'm one of them, that when it comes to the Word of God, that I realize that when I'm being distracted by cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches and lusts of other things, that it pulls me away from the Word of God and I'm not starting my day with the Word of God. I'm not ending the day with the Word of God. Okay? My prayer life starts failing. I'm not praying to the Lord as much. Hold on to that which is good. We're supposed to follow that which is good, seek that which is good, and when we find it, we hold on to it. We don't let it go. At one point you sought that which is good, Jesus Christ. And you hold on to him and you don't let him go. He'll never let you go, but you're not to let him go. Mm -hmm. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. There's times where brethren have taught me that they're in jobs that are very vexing and wicked, and I keep praying that the Lord opens doors for you. You might have to take a less paying job where you have to do twice the work, but it pleases the Lord. A lot of times when I see people that they're like, well, my job's vexing and everything, and, and everything, they stick with it because they like the pay and, and whatnot. But they, it's, it, I'm saying it's possible for them to take a less paying job where you have to do twice the amount of work but they don't want that but they'll claim oh I'm just so vexed and everything we just have to do it there's just sometimes you can't avoid. the Bible says we're to abstain from all appearance of evil and you're supposed to do your best to do that when it's within your power God puts it in your hands here's another job you to take it okay uh, you don't have to go to oh I like to go shopping but you know, it's kind of hard to abstain from all the then you don't go shopping. Uh, Brother, sister, Christ, I hardly go into town anymore. This happened before uh, all this junk that's going on in the world, you know, the bologna sandwiches. Um, I was kind of starting to get isolated to begin with. I just didn't want to go into town and be vexed by all the wickedness of the world. I try to go to the beaches, but I try to go on a weekday um, when there's not that many people. I uh, try to hand out gospel tracts, don't get me wrong, but I just, I'm kind of isolated from this world because uh, you have to abstain from all appearance of evil, and I don't want that wickedness. I don't want that temptation. You go to town, there's women dressed like men. You have immodestly dressed women. For the women, you have immodestly dressed men. Um, you have satanic style music. I'm walking around, people are talking about movies, TV shows, video games, uh, and stuff like that. Cussing using the Lord's name in vain, and so on and so forth. It says abstain from all appearance of evil. When it's within your power, I just don't have to go into town all, all the time. I used to go into town all the time, like, because I wanted to be around people, because I felt isolated, but now I don't. God's like, there's a reason you're isolated. Don't put that wickedness before your eyes. You don't need that temptation. Okay? Abstain from all appearance of evil. Period. No excuses. If you're working a job and you're trying to provide for your own and the job's very wicked, pray to the Lord for another job that's not as wicked. You might get paid less. You guys might have to really, what they call cinching your belt up, and you might have to live frugal and be content with food and raiment and barely getting by, but you'll have more peace in your life, more joy in your life. Abstain from all, and God will open doors. I believe that with all my heart. If you're truly praying and you're truly seeking a job that's less vexing, 
God will open up a door for you. I know a lot of people that have went into business for themselves, whether it's uh, cutting lumber and selling lumber, uh, growing foods, uh, lawn uh, landscaping, mowing lawns, a uh, handyman where they go and they fix stuff at people's houses. Uh, they've learned skills. They've had to learn skills. Whatever it is, okay. There's men that have had to work twice as hard. I make less. I make probably three fourths of what I used to make, or half of what I used to make, and I work twice as hard. But you know what? I have joy and peace in my heart. I'm not vexed like I was that job I used to have that was just evil and wickedness all around me. Verse 23, And the very God of peace, we just talked about that, peace a lot, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God will sanctify us. And when we, as we get sanctified and God cleans up our life, He's going to give us more and more peace. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body, there it is, spirit, soul, and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What state is God going to find you when He comes? What state? It's something that you have to ask yourself every... That's the whole point of communion, brother, sister, Christ. It's not about drinking some uh, grape juice and eating some bread. It has nothing to do with that uh, as far as the physical. It's spiritual. The whole point of communion is you look at your life and say, how is my life when it compares to this book right here? How is my walk with the Lord? If He come back today, is He going to be proud of me? Or is He going to be disappointed? That's the whole point, brother and sister Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. You're supposed to bring your thoughts into subjection to the obedience of Christ. You're supposed to keep your flesh down. Okay. Prayer, praying for one another, being there for one another. There's so much to it. Are you going to be considered? Uh, are, you, are you being preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? What state is God going to find you in? I always pray, and I've fallen sometimes. I keep praying, Lord, I want to be in a standing position. I want to be standing firm to your word with the life that I'm living. And I don't want you coming back finding me flat on my face when it comes to sin. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches. I want to be looking for you every day. Verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God is faithful. He saves you. He picks you up and starts putting you back on the right path. He's faithful to make it possible. I just talked about jobs. He's faithful. You pray, He'll find you another job that's not vexing, where you're not living in sin or having sin around you. He's faithful. Okay? Faithful is He that calleth you, who also will do it. He will come for the body of Christ. If I die before He comes, my soul, He will catch my soul up to heaven. And I will be with Him. He is faithful. He tells me that I can live this way. He's going to make it possible. He tells me I'm supposed to be living this way. He's going to make it possible. Remember what it says about temptation. There's no temptation that's taken as common, such as common to man, but will provide a way... Uh, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. He won't even forsake us when it comes to temptation. He'll make doors. He'll make ways for us to escape. Open doors. When you sin, it's, you fail the Lord. It's you. Nobody else's fault. I remember when we used to teach, uh, the one of the teachings I talked about, Craziest Man, Foolish Man, Adam. And talking about how Adam, when he was uh, confronted by God about his sin... He blamed Eve, and he blamed God for giving Eve to her. So he blamed God, and he blamed Eve. He blamed everybody but himself. Okay, God provides a way out. And of course, Eve blamed the snake. She didn't take responsibility either. And that's the first thought, is we want to blame somebody else, or it's something else. It's, it can't be my fault. But we have to, get to come to the end of ourselves to say, yes, it's my fault. God will provide a way out. He is faithful. Okay? He said He's coming for us. He's coming for us. Don't lose hope. Don't let anybody steal your crown when it comes to looking for that blessed hope that Jesus is coming back. Okay? That's a crown. 
looking for that hope. That's why Paul preached, even in his day, you're to look for that blessed hope. It's a crown of reward. I could die and Jesus comes back in my, child, in my daughter's time and I still get that reward because I was looking for Jesus Christ. I still get that crown because I was looking for Jesus Christ to come back every, any day. We're supposed to be looking in any generation. That, that's why Paul preached and taught that. I disagree with brethren when they try to teach that Paul knew he wasn't going to come back in his day. He, he, he was kind of preaching that he wasn't going to come back in his day. That's not what Paul did. He preached he could come back in his day. He was looking for Jesus Christ to come back. Now, Paul knew that his end was near as far as he was going to be martyred for Jesus Christ. He was going to wind up dying for Jesus Christ. That's different. 25. Brethren, pray for us. Two parts to this, to this. Doctrinally, I believe he's talking to men in ministry. You definitely need to be praying for men in ministry in these last days. That the light, we try to keep the light. There's so few of us. Keep the light shining. Keep the truth out there. Keep preaching truth. Keep standing for truth. For instruction and righteousness, pray for us. Pray for the whole body of Christ that we stand. We stay faithful to the Lord that He is faithful. He's coming for us. I see so many brethren falling away and when Jesus does come, He's going to find them falling flat on their face. And He's going to be disappointed in them. Now, people, I'm not saying he's going to hate them, because people will take it to extremes. I said disappointed. You can still love somebody and be disappointed in them. He's going to find them disappointed. Okay? We need to be praying for the brethren. Every day I pray for the brethren. Every day it seems like I'm talking to the Lord about men in ministry, where some of them are starting to fall. The men that aren't in ministry anymore, they just disappeared. They must have fallen away. They're not doing anything for the Lord as far as... As far, as far as online. They might still be doing something for the Lord where they're at. Don't get me wrong. I can't see everything. I'm not Jesus. But hopefully you understand what I'm saying, brother says Christ. We need to be praying for those men in ministry. We need to be praying for young men to come up and take old men. <laughs> I'm not that old, but I'm getting old. Old men's place. If Jesus doesn't come back in my time, and I'm not saying this as far as doubt. I'm talking about, you look at the Paul's time to now. If Jesus didn't come back in Paul's time, he had Timothy to take over. Titus, he had men that he was raising up to be ministers, to be preachers, to be teachers. So he goes, they take over. And then the next generation has men, young men that come up and take over. And the next generation, the next generation, we've kind of lost that. The mentorship, mentoring young men in ministry, it's not there hardly. First, we need the young men to be there. And secondly, we need to take time to, to do that. A lot of men in ministry, I'm just so busy, I'm just so busy. They're not taking time to minister to young men in ministry. I just don't have time. Okay. We need to be praying for brothers in Christ that get called into the ministry, that they stay faithful to the Word of God. God opens the Scriptures to them so they can teach it in a way that it reaches people. Not compromising, don't compromise, but different teaching styles. Okay. We need to pray for that. We need to pray for the brethren that they stand for the Word of God in the life that they're living. We see people falling left and right. Pray, pray, pray. Pray without ceasing. Okay. Greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. That's why I wanted to read this. I was reading this saying, I just want to read this to the brothers and sisters of Christ and talk with you. It's a Bible reading. It's not really a hardcore study. It's a Bible reading. We're just talking. And I wanted to read this to you guys as, as comfort. Also, I want to read this, guy, read this to you guys to edify. It says, verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. I wanted to warn you. Hey, what kind of state are you in? Are you obeying all these things? Okay. So, please, 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 brothers and sisters in Christ, stay in the Word of God every day. Prayer every day. Make sure you're going about your life and, you're, and you talk with the Lord about your life saying, Hey, what do I need to still get out? Where am I failing you? Where do I need to please you more? Where do I need to put more emphasis on? It's cares of the world coming in and preventing me from reading the Word of God. I used to do a Bible study, like watch. Let's say you used to watch a Bible study, an hour-long Bible study every day. 
But now you just don't have time. Well, what's going on? Is there cares of this world coming in and getting in the way of your fellowship with the Lord? I used to go out and do go and hand out gospel tracts, but I really don't do it that much anymore. I'm just too busy with other stuff. Cares of this world coming in and getting in the way of your living for the Lord? Deceitfulness of riches? Well, i got to work three or four jobs because I want all this stuff. And you don't have time for the Lord? You need to cut back on those jobs and say, I need to learn to live and be content with what I have. With whatever state the Lord has me in. The worst thing, I, I, I'm sorry, but the worst thing that can happen to a pastor is he starts collecting a lot, a preacher or teacher, he starts having a lot of things. Okay, I talk from experience, I'm pointing at this guy right here. There's times where I can get wrapped up to the, and start getting caught up in the wants and not being content with the need that God's already provided for me. Okay, the worst thing you can do is, the worst thing a pastor can do is strike it rich. <laughs> I'll say it like that. It's the worst thing that can happen to a pastor. Okay? We need to be content. But I pray that this whole reading that you had taken time with me to sit here with me and, and um, make comments if you want in the comment section. I just want to put up, I have the P.O. box. I pay for it. I don't really get anything in it. It's always junk mail mostly. But very rarely I get a letter from a brother or sister in Christ. Praise the Lord. I have my email. Uh, brethren have been asking me questions. But uh, the biggest thing, I'll point this out real quick because we're just talking. What I used to love about the comment section and YouTube was is that with Brother Brian and with me, I try to do the same thing, that when someone asks a question, a brother in Christ can come along and answer that question. They might be asking me the question, but a brother in Christ that knows the answer according to Scripture will come along and answer that question. What happens? I'm not a ministry of one. I'm not a one-man show. I don't have all the answers. Okay, you don't always have to come to me for the answers. I love that whole thing about where pe brethren would come in and answer the question with Scripture. And I'd go to type, oh wait, a brother in Christ already answered it. Praise the Lord. Thank you. That whole thing. Um, so I have no problem, like I said, don't get me wrong. Here comes the wind again. <laughs> I love when brothers and sisters in Christ email me and ask me questions about the Bible. And I'll do my best to answer, but I don't have all the answers. And I mean that. I don't have all the answers. There's times where they'll ask me questions about the Old Testament, and I'll be like, I'll try to look at it a little bit and be like, well, I'm sorry, I just, I don't know. If you, you get, I, maybe another brother in Christ has actually done a study on it, and they have the answers. I just don't have all the answers. I don't know. Because um, I've, I've heard people say that, that they like Peter Ruckman, and I'm not putting him down, but he's done an expository study on the entire Bible, and yet he'll sit there and say, I don't have an answer for everything. And yet he'll give a person the answer to the question they just asked. He'll say, well, I don't have an answer for everything. And then he'll answer the question. And it's like, but you act like you have an answer for everything. But you'll say it, but your deeds are, I have an answer for everything. Um, but I love that, getting back to the thing, I love the whole fellowship where a brother in Christ comes on and answers it. And it's not because I'm lazy. There's times I answered questions that people would ask questions under Brother Brian's video, and I would answer the question with Scripture. Um, or another brother would hit in there, and I, I'd go, Amen, underneath. And it said, The Lord showed me that same thing, that same answer. And, um, you know, that, that feeling. But the, the body of Christ, it just seems like we're going quiet. We're not saying as much. We're not making as many comments. We're not emailing each other as much. Like I said, the... Um, I have the P.O. box there because if Brethren wanted to donate some old Bibles um, or if Brethren wanted to donate books that are good books. If you donate a bad book, I, I'm not really doing that. You know, like a bad book that you want me to critique it and do a video on it. I really don't feel like God's calling me to that because I'm not good at that kind of research. Um, but, you know, uh, you, know, you want to send me some books that are good books. You know, I love old books. Um, this is the number one book I read since my eyes aren't doing so well. <laughs> um, I always read, read this book um, the most. Um, so I have all these other books just stacked there that I'm supposed to get around to and get to reading. And I do that during the winter when it's raining and I'm stuck inside. But um, this video has been long. I need to stop ranting, <laughs> going off on a tangent. But the P.O. box is there, brothers and sisters of Christ, for you guys to use if you feel like it. If you don't want to use it, that's fine. If you feel like called that you want to donate, by all means, use. Uh, 
you know, mail me something. But there's brothers and sisters, and I pray that you are, if you are, God has blessed you above and beyond. You know, you're living, learning. In these last days, if we want to help brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm speaking from experience, if you want to help brothers and sisters in Christ, you've got to learn to cinch your belt up. <laughs> uh, be a penny pusher as far as your life. And you're going to have to learn to be content with food and raiment so you can have a little extra money to donate to help out the brothers and sisters of Christ. Not just men in ministry, but brethren that are having some hard times. Okay, be in there to help them out financially. I want to be there to help them out physically, but we're so. I had I had a brother in Christ email me. I think it was an email that, uh, or as a comment, uh, that he was like he's clear up in uh, another country, and he's he's like I wish I was there to help you with the deck because the deck's kind of falling apart, and I it's just the boards on top are rot, dry rotting, and I've replaced some of them, but I don't have the strength to push the drills all the 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 screw all the way through, and. Um, it's just that it's starting to dry rot, and I need a major repair done on this deck in the next five years. i got to get a major repair done. Um, the retaining wall. I'm trying to do things myself, but like I said, I just don't have the strength, and I can't work on a hillside like that anymore. Um, and uh, he's like, I wish I was there to help. And I, I, I praise the brother. I wish you were here to help too. Um, but if you are, and there are brothers and sisters of Christ around you, please help them. Please be there for him physically as well as spiritually. Um, but everything we talked about in here. So I guess I'm just going through it again. Uh, so just it, it, just these last days, brothers and Christ, it just seems like the body of Christ is fading. We're, we're drifting apart spiritually, even though we're physically apart, which is hardship. But it seems like spiritually we're also kind of drifting apart. So brothers and Christ, stay strong. Keep praying for one another. Men in ministry and for the brothers and sisters of Christ as a whole. Try to stay in fellowship with some of the brethren, okay? I pray this with all my heart. So, I usually end the prayer with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus. However, verse 28 <laughs> in this, I'm still going to end with that, but also verse 28, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Thank you for watching.